First off, I love my kids. This is Learning to Dad. I'm the cool dad. That's, that's my thing. With Tyler Ross. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. I'm going to have fun, and you're going to have fun. So anyway, we were talking about this, you know, this nine nations thing. Yeah, so we had to stop because we had to pee off the side of the porch. So. <laughs> Glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's the nice thing about having a small forest is if anybody objects to me taking a leak off my own front porch, they're trespassing. You, you have a 360 degree range of urination here. Exactly. <laughs> I like it. That's the goal for my next house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put that in the remarks of the multiple listings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Must be able to pee. A young couple looking for place they can pee anywhere. Anywhere <laughs> they like, right? Like like the like the proverbial bear in the forest. <laughs> yeah. Anywhere they want. Anywhere they want. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have right. bears now, by the way. Oh, do you? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just jam. They, they got to go somewhere. Yep, that's right. So anyway, so yeah, so nine nations. So you were saying it has the country fragmented irre- irrevocably well here's what i can tell you is that back in the day in the 70s you know, there we knew some things for a stone cold fact mm-hmm. we knew there was this border in in the place like colorado and east of this border in the plains and the wheat fields was one ki- was one civilization and west of it in the rockies was an entirely different Okay. civilization we we know we knew this for sure as we were born it was you know it was a news map and when we started talking to each other we began to link these up and we realized oh my god it's like this in the whole continent yeah anyway but we <clears throat> it took us you know where did these lines come from where did we hallucinate this or, or what and um anyway and then and how do you, one of the things i discovered was that if you had a twin brother, I could demonstrate to you that there would be differences between you and him. Sure. So what that means in principle in now is that in principle you could come up with the 326 million nations of the United States. That every single okay. one of us is different. Fair, yeah. Yeah. So, so where did this nine come from? Well... The, these turned out to be the biggest places about which you could say something meaningful okay. and something important. Mm-hmm. That's where they came up. For, and it was originally a news map in the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. This is where the news occurred. Boundaries between clashing cultures is where news occurs. The, you know, it's, it's the, it's the, cla- it's the oh, clang that you hear. N- That's the news. Never thought of it in that way. Yeah, that's the news. And so uh, I'll give you an example. So like back then, back in the day, there was uh, the, the farmers were all upset that, about federal policy. And they were figure, figuring they were screwed. And they were right. And so they all showed up in Washington with their heavy equipment, with their tractors. And they started roaring up and down the, the mall in, in D.C. And uh, so we had to go out and do something about what, you know, what's the problem? Well, the... New York Times, predictably enough, sent their reporters to Iowa, and their story sucked. Yeah. Because Iowa is the center of the breadbasket, and all of the institutions and all of the banks and everything is set up to do everything the farmer's way. Yeah. Because we'd been working on these borders, we sent to Colorado. Oh, yeah. Because that's where you'd find the pissed off farmers, mm-hmm. because they, f- because at the time, the western part of Colorado, this is where you know, this is after the energy crisis, yeah. this is where everybody was was you know, looking for oil shale and tar sands and all that stuff in the west, and so Denver isn't the capital of anything particularly important. It's just the border town between these two warring worlds yeah. of eastern Col- of the breadbasket and the empty quarter and. <laughs> So, I mean, we knew this existed for a fact, but how that could be or why that could be, that's what took some took longer to, to understand. And, in fact, it wasn't until after the Nine Nations book came out, I mean, this is one surprise after another, 
you know, and it became at nine. So, I, I mean, I thought the way this worked is you write a book, you hand it in, they publish it, end of story. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's never the end. The, you know, and I, what, all I wanted out of this was to see all of the continent. I, so I, I spent 100,000 miles traveling around the continent. That's all. And, that's, and I got what I wanted. Well, the thing came out, and then the, this really amazing things happened. Like, it became a cult item among marketers and broadcasters and uh, automobile manufacturers. Yeah. The nine nations of Lincoln Mercury. No, really, they did that. No way. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and political operatives. Mm -hmm. It's still a cult item, kind of. How, yeah. Yeah, how do you feel about that? How does that make Astonished. you feel? Astonished. Yeah. Slack jawed. Well, anyway, and that, it... it so that got me. It's, I mean, that's when I began to realize. Oh wait a minute. This is not a geography book. This is not about geography. It's about culture and values, isn't it? This is about who we are, how we got that way, where we're headed, and what makes us tick. Mm -hmm. And it's a story that goes forward, goes backwards for four hundred years, and it goes forward as for as far as the eye can see. And it's enduring. And despite all of the upheavals. You know, I mean, this is not the worst time the, the the republic has ever been through. You know, it's it's it endures and it matters. And these were not the old-fashioned culture and values. Like, for example, what whole what 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 what, what the southeast that I call Dixie. It's an old word, but it's in a new, but it's a brand new place. And what holds that together is not so much the ancient past, but the fact that it's been the most it's the place that's been the most whipsawed and future shocked by change. Okay. That's what holds the Southeast together. And I'm talking, you know, basically from Houston to Northern Florida to the Southern Virginia. And uh, this, is, this is a place where they're still dealing with. Dixie was a place that was liberated, essentially, by the federal government in the 60s from all of those centuries of, of uh, being a place that was primarily agricultural, mm -hmm. primarily backward, primarily disease-ridden, primarily racist. And it's not like that anymore. It just really isn't. I mean, it's it's a new place, but there's still, it's really genuinely a new place, but people are still coming to grips with that. And so, and they're doing it in a variety of different ways, and there's a whole lot more voices that you hear now in Dixie than you did 50 years ago. And uh, and so they're inventing this as they go along at the same time that history is never dead. Mm -hmm. So that's why the Southeast is such an interesting place to look at and why it's such a fascinating movie to watch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to go a hundred different directions because I could talk to you on a hundred different topics and never feel wanting for stimulation but i'm gonna i'm gonna do a hard i'm gonna do a hard shift to being a grandparent yeah so i i can just leave it at that or i can ask you a more direct question try the direct question and i'll ignore it or not if i see fit <laughs> fair enough, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, so let's talk about context because you're not a futurist but people might accuse you of being that like how do you feel about the context of raising kids when you raise kids versus the context in which your daughter is raising children? Yeah. So I've got a um, my my first and only grandkid, Louis Roland Solit. Roland is his middle name. It's my father's name. So he he's part of the family, and uh, he's now two and a half, and he's. Uh, He's really interesting. I mean, the one thing I can say for sure, for absolute stone sure, about the difference about the way he's growing up and the, and the way my kids grew up is that he's got a lot, Lewis has got a lot smarter parents than they did. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. A lot more smarter and, and, and more sophisticated and thoughtful and all that jazz. I mean, I, so, I, mean I think all of these kids, I, mean, I think that's the good news about all of your, your 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 peers and your pals and all that stuff is they're just a lot smarter and hipper than we were mm -hmm. back in the day, and uh, uh, I'm really impressed. I mean, you know, uh, I'm really impressed by the ex examples that I see. Like, you know, you're like you, 
your sister Ryan just had a kid. And, yeah. uh, you know, I just have a hunch she's going to be a much better parent than... She's already an amazing <laughs> parent. Yeah. Yeah, she's just... Na- it feels yeah. like she's a natural. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And and you, for that matter. You know, uh, uh, even you. <laughs> <laughs> After these stories that you've shared, yeah. I do feel like it is even Tyler. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> They're yeah. so exceptional. But, I mean, no, I mean, uh, I'm teasing. But, you know, I think people rise to the occasion... So to say what I, you know, what I do it differently. Well, if I had to do it all over again, well, I mean, it, I, you know, as the, the old cliche goes, life is a river. You can never step into the same place twice. And so, yeah. you know, we did the best we could under the circumstances with what we had, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, and people today have an entirely different set of circumstances and they're learning from it and. And they're adapting on the run, and uh, and among the people I admire, who are in the parenting game now, they they move faster. Yeah. They you know that than we than we possibly could have at the time, and uh, so my reading of history is that it's always a balance. It's always a very precarious balance between what Dickens called the best of times and worst of times. You know, there was, the whole thing is about to fall apart and the whole thing is about to be an incredible explosion of, you know, I mean, we're, we're halfway between heaven and hell all the, all the time. That's a constant throughout all of these millennia. Yeah, Jordan Peterson calls it chaos and shit never mind yeah <laughs> <laughs> too much tequila yep <laughs> that's a fact yeah there you go as we have more cling <laughs> well let me let me ask you this what's an advantage you had in your period of time raising kids that simone and john do not have raising lewis and i'll flip that well i can i mean well, let me speak personally rather than, I mean, cosmically and all that stuff. Sure. One of the, one of, so anyway, so when, when Adrian and I met, you know, we were both working at the at the Post and all that stuff. And uh, and we, you know, started dating. And then she moved and we started shacking up and uh, uh, and all that stuff. And anyway, when she continued working and she ended up working for, well, all this time she ended up working for the Annapolis, left, left the Post to get a better job at the Annapolis, Maryland Capitol. And then she left that to get a better job at, the uh, St. Petersburg, Florida Times, and all this time we were doing these, you know, long distance romance and all that stuff. And uh, anyway, and then she came back, and uh, at some point, she decided that she was really burning out. And I said, Tell you what, let's do a division of responsibility. Mm-hmm. I'll make the money, and you do everything else. Yeah. And, uh, and so we did, and uh, I mean, this has not prevented her from working. I mean, she's got her own company where she does food shows and prestigious locations like that. She just came back from, for the, like the U.S. Botanical Garden on the Mall in, in Washington, and she's the longtime chairman of the Fauquier County Planning Commission. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, anyway, so Simone, my eldest daughter, refers to her as a French chef with a zo- with a Jones for zoning. <laughs> That's that's pretty good. Pretty funny, huh? Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> I know it to be true, also, because yeah. I've I've sat in front of her in the yeah. com- in the commission and I've eaten her food. Pretty funny. <laughs> anyway, and so anyway, so she but she wanted to really her what she really wanted to be to had to do this old McDonald farm thing, mm-hmm. and uh, which in which is in our previous farm at uh, at New Moon Hay, we she raised. Cattle, hogs, ch- chicken, chicken, geese, ducks, rabbits, the whole nine yards. Wow. Uh, we pushed $15,000 worth of meat in, in 70s money mm-hmm. uh, per acre. Wow. Off yeah. that land. And, uh, and I mean, we kind of, she kind of anticipated today's locavore and, and organic, all of that stuff. None of that stuff existed at the time. Yeah. She kind of was a pioneer of that. Anyway, and, but the only way she could do that was if she gave up, all, you know, her, quote unquote real jobs right so i said fine you do this i'll do that and uh so i ended up holding down what amounted to three jobs and she ended up doing our dream yeah and uh 
and uh, and that continued when she got pregnant and we started having the two kids and all that stuff. And uh, that's a, you know, this was not an old time marriage where it was the breadwinner and the child. I mean, this was this was a a, a modern thing in which we we both had plenty of alternatives and we consciously chose to do this because it's what each one of us wanted and uh yeah knowing you i can attest to that anyone listening that has doubts about that claim i i can put to rest yeah Yeah. and i mean there's not a chance that i was could talk her into anything no i believe that too to this day to this day yeah i mean she's plenty she's yeah i mean she's she's one of these not pussies yeah that is so true she, you know yep. not, she's not resilient grit whatever the word you she want shouldn't for even it. have to tell you what to do you already know <laughs> yeah that's right she's already inside my head that's right no that's a good point but anyway so that so anyway so we were able to now so today one of the problems with having two in, two income families is that uh, that becomes the new normal yeah and uh, you end up basing your mortgage around that and stuff like that, about having yes. two. So that I'm not sure that Samoa, I mean, it would be tr- it would be tough if for either John, for John or Samoa, my, you know, my my eldest or my, and my son-in-law, it would be tough for them to decide that they wanted to be, they wanted to be a one-person income mm-hmm. and let the other follow their bliss. Yeah. So anyway, so that I don't envy them that. But anyway, I mean, everybody's got it's every nuts. every generation has new challenges to face. We yeah. faced ours. We did the best we could, and then we're going to die. Yep. You know, <laughs> you know, and then well, yeah. and, and we did the best we could with what we had at the time. Yeah. And everybody, and everybody will do that anyway. But uh, but the, everybody faces different circumstances, and uh, so anyway, so there, and you know what, Simone, so. Lewis is two and a half. And, you know, and there are certain predictable aspects of having a kid. And you can't tell any young parent that there are certain predictable aspects of this. <laughs> you cannot. It's, it's just yeah. pointless. You just have to wait. They'll just wait. Yeah. You know, and uh, so like one of them is the one of the stages is. We've traveled the world. We're not going to change how we do things just because we've had a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Remember that? My, my favorite thing was when we had kids and we would not do things and people without kids would judge us for not doing those yeah. things. Well, yeah, it's exactly. Like one so day I, you'll understand. Well, it worked. I mean, so it worked for us for a while, you know, yeah. so we and we didn't change until Simone turned 18 months. And that was the moment. When we learned, Simone, 18 months was the maximum mobility with the minimum understanding of the word no. (laughs) What a great description. (laughs) What a perfect description. (laughs) And I'd had this speech, and we were at some resort at the corporation, you know, having the thing in Arizona, and it had nine swimming pools. Yeah. And Simone, at 18 months, spent the entire time trying to jump into the <laughs> and drown. Yep. Adrian and I didn't even see each other for like two days. You know, we were doing this in shift. Mm-hmm. One of us was sleeping and the other was chasing some out. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, so I mean that, so that's after that we learned, okay, it's going to, this model is going to take a little adjustment. <laughs> the hardest I've ever worked in my entire life was one year ago at Litchfield Beach at a family vacation. I've never worked so hard in my life trying to keep my mm-hmm. kids from getting sucked into the ocean. There you go. Yeah. I empathize with you right yeah. there. Yeah. So there, I mean, so at this, I mean, my, one of the things I've learned to, you know, think about the future is that the longer, the farther back you look, the farther f- forward you can see. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it pay. I mean, somebody once said that the, you can tell how long a book will last by its oldest footnote. <laughs> if it's yeah. if its oldest footnote goes back eight thousand years, it might have a shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, wow. And uh, 
there's something to that. Anyway, so it's uh, so I guess that's so so you know it, it, what you're doing is 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 getting is is working on the signal to noise ratio what's signal and what's noise okay you know what's static and what's important yeah and um so anyway so some of it is some of the differences between generations is a lot of it is static mm -hmm. so you got a new so you got twitter big deal big whoop yeah you know but i mean but what does that mean to what it means to be human well that's a really good question and i'll get back to you on that uh, that's part of that five-hour conversation we could have about <laughs> the other things. Let's All make right. another hard pivot and talk about education because I think that you are very well equipped to talk about it as somebody who considers scenarios going down the road, somebody that teaches and uh, professes at a, hmm. a university and and that's spend my a little that's bit my of time story. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. So, do you think that if you had if you had a kid now, or, or advising your your daughter and son-in-law on educating their kid, do you think that you would take the same approach as you did educating your your kids? Actually, they're showing me. Yeah, I'm I'm really impressed. Like uh, I'm really impressed. So you know, so they both got high, big deal, high pressure jobs. Yeah, and so and so daycare was a f given. Yep, just a given. I mean, there was just no, I mean, it just, it, it, there was no other, that, nothing else entered into the equation. Right. Well, so they chose this daycare place that was bilingual. Interesting, yeah. So, uh, anyway, the, the it has some fancy formal name, but John and Simone call it the Maria's. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, anyway, and it, so anyway, so, uh. They were having a parent teach, teacher conference once, and uh, and the one of the teachers asked, "Does Lewis speak English at home?" It's an interesting question to ask to very white people. That's right. Yeah. Simone said, "Uh, yeah." <laughs> Occasionally, big Latin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, but um, but it was fascinating. I thought it was just fascinating that the to me and probably to her that the teacher didn't not didn't necessarily know the answer to that question because he was pretty f he was speaking like a native in Spanish yeah. at the age of two and a half. I mean, to the extent that a two and a half year old speaks right. Oh, language. wow, sure, okay. And and it's and it's really interesting in that uh, to, I, to me anyway, he really early come came up with a very sophisticated idea of who you spoke which language to. That's an interesting distinction for two, two and a half years old. Or even a one and a half year old. Yeah. yeah. I mean so you they so you know, they he knew he knew that I he, you know, he takes one look at me and it's English and you know mm -hmm. so, I mean he just knows. Now, I mean is that a conscious calculation? No, it's a it's something that's now hardwired in his little brain. Yeah. And uh Anyway, so we didn't have that option for any of our kids, and uh, which we did. But it was, and but it was just. Uh, I mean, I give John and Simone astonishing amounts of credit for thinking this far forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, start them young. Yeah, and that I mean, it's not just babysitting. It's as long as you're going to do this, let's let's think about resilience. Yeah. Let's think about grit. Let's think about not being a pussy yeah <laughs> i like it. it it all makes so much sense and uh I, you answered the question such a different way than i expected but i appreciate it so much because it's an important thing to think about because i don't think a lot of people think about educating their kids until they hit kindergarten right which so much happens between zero and then so uh, anybody listening i think that's a tremendous piece of advice to be considerate from the get go. From the get go, uh, before they can talk. Yeah, I, that, that's uh, I give John and Simone. I mean, it's, it's, it's all they're doing. This never would have occurred to me. Didn't occur to me back in the day. No, it, it really, uh, it, it's crossed my mind. But I, I, I prioritized uh, how my kids feel. I think. Thank right. you. Yeah, thank you. Luna Azul, Blue Moon. Yeah, there you um, go. So. I've, I've kind of prioritized my kids feeling loved over 
It's not an either or situation. It's not at all. No, I guess I didn't think to look for the other thing. I think this checks the box that's important to me. I didn't realize that there was another box to check. Yeah, that's so right. I, I, if I had to do it over again, if I could get love and yeah, that I would do that. Right, multiple layers. I mean, it's always it's always this and that and some other thing. Yeah. That's the one thing you learn when you start look thinking about, systematically about the future. It's it's never either or. Yeah, it's both and both and both and both. Do you have an opinion about raising kids in the country versus the city? Well, I think it's a lot easier in the city. You think so? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, there's just so much more available. I mean, we had to, we had to do, well, I don't know. I could be talking through my ass. Well, what about they, from the kids' perspective? Like, what do you think is a... Simone you know, wanted to get out of Fauquier County as fast as her that? little legs could carry her. Well, there's another story. So, <laughs> <laughs> you want to know the story? Yeah, so... Uh, so there, so there we were. Simone was, you know, you know the difference between a fairy tale and a fire and a Montana smoke jumper story. <laughs> I only have heard of one of those, so I, the difference could be. Fairy anything. tale starts once upon a time. Yeah. And a Montana smoke jumper story starts. So there I was, and this is no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I love Montana that. smoke jumpers are the guys who jump out of airplanes with a parachute into a perfectly good, uh, okay. raging forest fire. Yes, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so so here I was. So anyway, so Simone is in junior year, getting anyway, and uh, sophomore year even. I mean, that was another one of the things that it just went without saying. She she now tells the story that she was going to go to college. Yeah. And we started, and she was going to focus, and you know, the deal was, you get into the best college you can, and I'll figure out how to pay for it. Yeah. So anyway, and that it was abundantly clear, clear to them by the time they were early in high, into high school. Anyway, well, high on Simone's list of priorities was to get as far away from Fauquier County, Virginia, <laughs> as she possibly could. <laughs> so we. I spent a fortune on air tickets, and we showed it. And they, she, we toured colleges all over the place, all over every bloody time zone. Yeah. And uh, and at the end, Adrian said, "Listen, would you humor your old mom and look at the universities in D.C., mm -hmm. please?" Yeah. So okay, fine. So they went to the D.C. colleges, and Simone took l one look at George Washington University. And fell in love. Yeah. That was the place. <laughs> Natural. After all these plane yeah. tickets. Well, if you'd showed that to her first. Right. She would, it's an old realtor trick. Show them shitty houses yeah. and then show them the house they love. Right. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That's it. That's it. So anyway, so she came back to Highland and uh, she said, okay, I know where I'm going. And uh, so anyway, and uh, and apparently her classmates ended up saying to her, so, I hear you're going north to school. <laughs> this is what, 44 <laughs> miles away? <laughs> Asphalt 44 miles. As yeah. the crow flies, yeah. less. Right. But, you know, and they weren't kidding. Yeah. And they weren't wrong. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I, I always considered Fauquier where the north meets the south. I right. Yeah. Yeah, it really is different. Mm -hmm. it, they weren't wrong. Truly, yeah. Anyway, so... Uh, well, of course, she would hear none of this, naturally. <laughs> and <laughs> anyway, so anyway, so she went off to GW. And uh, she came back at Thanksgiving. And the first thing she did was go to, what's the name of the gift shop in the Plains? Uh, Peyton's? Peyton's. Okay. And she got herself a pillow that says, that's not the way we do it in the South. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfect dorm room. And pillow. she brought it back, and that was what she put on her pillow. <laughs> Which, if, you know, if only there could be a little carrot in there that said 40 miles south of here. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so, being uh, uh, in college, effectively, spending time on college campuses. I'm starting to become of the opinion that by the kid, by the time my four and five year old are college age, the model of college education is going to be totally different. I f fully anticipate my kids not going to college. Um, 
maybe it's as not we happen currently that, understand as it. we currently understand it yeah do you have a, an opinion on the way it looks now the way it looked 20 years ago and the way it's going to look 20 years from now i'm trying to remember who once said the best way to anticipate the future is to invent it yourself okay and uh so i work for arizona state university which i, I mentioned you know is the been ranked by U.S. News again and, and again as the number one innovation Which university is risky. in America. Yeah, that's right. It is. But anyway, so but we're at pretty much at the. I mean, wh when I now visit legacy universities like Harvard or Stanford, I mean, it, I feel like I'm in a diorama. Yeah. You know, you forget that not everybody else is like this at ASU. I mean, they 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 they're, they're still doing the same old stuff in the same old ways. I mean, you forget that, that there are places like this. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, so I don't think we know what the future is, but the only way to rationally address what has to be this change is to get your hands dirty. Yeah. You have to get your you have to get up to your elbows and do it. Mhm. Mm and uh see what works and what doesn't and uh uh and that's what so many colleges and universities colleges so many legacy colleges and universities are just or ignoring this and hoping it'll all go back to normal quote unquote someday yeah. yeah they're not and they're not doing this so uh so anyway so another story so uh back in 1999 steven spielberg had a problem mm -hmm. The movie director, the famous Steven Spielberg. Sure, yeah. And uh, his problem was that he'd bought the rights to this short story, 26-page short story called The Minority Report mm. by this dystopian crazy guy named Philip K. Dick. So he had the rights. And he'd signed on Tom Cruise as the as a star. Yeah. And that's it. He didn't have anything else. Well, and he had this problem. He had no idea what the world would look like 50 years out in this movie. No idea, no clue. So he called up a friend of his by the name of Peter Schwartz, who was the chairman of an outfit called Global Business Network, which is the great granddaddy of scenario planning in North America. And uh, he said, I need a world. So Peter ended up bringing together and I was a part of the of GBN at the time and and they had a, about a hundred of us who were quote unquote remarkable people RPs and what we were as heretics we were designated heretics because you couldn't have basked in that more happily I'm couldn't, sure I died and gone to heaven yeah. oh my God, I was finally <laughs> being and uh, so anyway so he brought together 15 of us heretics in Shutters on the Beach in Santa Monica. Fabulous hotel. Yeah. And sat right out there on the water. With, you know, the, the irritating palm trees. Waft, you know, <laughs> noisy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, and the surf. Just, you know, would you please t tune down Turn the surf? Turn it down a little, guys. Yeah, just, it was yeah. great. Anyway, so uh, we went there for two days, and we invented the world for oh, the Minority shit, Report. That, yeah. I've seen that movie 20 times. Yeah. We invented and And, of course, Minority Report... Ended up, people st still talk about how uncannily accurate it was about projecting the future, you know, just your computers and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it, well, it wasn't prediction. It was the these guys who were sitting around that table at Shutters, they were all people who were inventing the future at that time. Yeah. So like, what they, they knew what was in the pipeline because they were creating it. Yeah. And so all they did was talk about what was... A sure thing in X number of years, or I mean, well, it seemed to them to be a sure thing, in X, because they were building it at the time. Yeah. That's why it's uncannily accurate. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, they, they cheated. <laughs> they were just, yeah, they were just, they weren't making predictions. They were reporting yeah. on what was in the pipeline. Yeah. So anyway, so, um, fine. And so the movie came out in, in the 2000s. And uh, three years ago, there was some anniversary of the movie. 
And I said, wouldn't it be cool if we brought every if we brought the rock and roll band back? Yeah. <laughs> if we got everybody back together. So yeah. I we brought them all. I brought them all to a, to Arizona State University. In Arizona. No kidding. Yeah. And uh, anyway, and for and uh, we decided that. Well, because we had to have some some other than drink, we had to have some some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had to do something official. To, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so we decided that what we we're going to do is reinvent the future again. Cool. Reinvent the world again. Yeah. And our focal topic was, what will knowledge enterprises look like in the year 2050 or something like no that? No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. And we used the word knowledge enterprise advisedly. Because we didn't want to assume that universities existed, or as we as as they are now today, or colleges. Okay. But, but what we could, what we thought was it was a embedded an embedded assumption that that would hold up was that no matter what was happening fifty years from now, there would still be a mechanism for knowledge transfer. Yeah. And you know, it's hard to imagine how that, that wouldn't that, happen. That mechanism is starting to feel more like mechanical. Well, that was the question. This is where scenarios come in. Yeah. So naturally, the first thing you occur to is it's all going to be electronic. Blah, 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 matrix yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. yes. Matrix and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, that's one scenario. Mm -hmm. But there are many. So what are the... Anyway, so... But there, there's lots of other possibilities. So anyway, this time we did it again. And we invent, and we, we decided to, to work the future on the future. Anyway, and on... on on uh, how what does knowledge enterprise look like, and uh, but this time we did it. Last time it was highly secret down in the basement of the shutters, <laughs> for just it's us, us and, and 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 Mr. Spielberg and about forty of his best friends with all this equipment and gear and stuff. So, anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the federal government and Steven yeah. Spielberg, yeah. the highest level of secrecy, yeah. Yeah. and. Uh, but anyway, this time we did it in public, and we did it, you know, and there were hundreds of people, you know, and, and, and lots of ASU faculty involved and all that stuff. We did it anyway. And at the and end, like whiteboarding in front of everybody. Yeah, except whiteboard. Yeah, except this was far beyond whiteboard. It yeah. was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were doing, we had more whiz bang than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That. I mean, after all, we have a reputation overall. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> You're on your hoverboards and holograms. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, we had, to, we, had to, yeah, we had to be a little bit more whiz bang than that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and one of the guys who was there was, you know, like, for example, Jaron Lanier, who invented virtual reality. Okay. So it's like we had no choice, you know, I mean, it would... Uh, on, on, on the on the on the on the whiz bang front, you know, we had we we couldn't embarrass Jaron. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You see, you're not handing out blue and red cardboard glasses at the front. Uh, right, it's it's for real. Yeah, it's the real deal. Yeah, and that's who these guys were, and uh, so I mean, so a lot of this came naturally. But um, but the core <clears throat> thing was that the word knowledge enterprise came from. Michael Crow, our visionary president at ASU, and I use visionary advisedly. I don't throw that word around casually. Anyway, but ASU has the one of its big operations is called the Office of Knowledge Enterprise Development. And knowledge enterprise is, Michael chose that phrase carefully because he, because he was designed, he, call, he calls himself a knowledge architect. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he thinks of himself as an architect. And, and he's saying, you know, so you have to c think about how knowledge is going to be architected 50 years out. And you can't assume that the current universities or colleges or whatever are going to exist. They may. Mm -hmm. That's a perfectly valid scenario. Perfectly sure. reasonable. Yeah. Not to be dismissed. Could be there's going to be a lot of people who like the idea of sitting around, you know, on the quad, you know, and, and so forth. I mean... So I mean I'm not dismissing it at all, of course. But uh, but anyway, so uh, so knowledge enterprise, and we were doing this in the public, and we were engaging these these people in the pr program. You know, we broke them up into tables and did scenarios and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, and a lot of the critical uncertainties would be, well, what does society look like then? You know, what does family look like then? What does implants look like that? Yeah. You know, all yeah. kinds of things. 
and uh, so we had all, and we factored all that in, and uh, and we came up anyway, and we came back up at the uh, at the end of this, in, in back in the group session, and that's the moment at which I realized that of all these guys, at least half a dozen of them had created companies had created operations that had a track record of successful, I mean, existence proof that they had successfully designed the future. Wow. We had existence proof. That was an inflection point in history. For, for millions, for, for, millenn for millennia, humans have viewed the future as something that happens to them. Sure. They're along for the ride. Mm-hmm. Well, these guys, if they have existence proof that you can cre that you can design the future and create it, the existence proof, then that's a big deal. That means you can steer. Yeah. Thus was born the Guide Project, which I'm the director of, founding director of, which is the the Guide Project: How to Design the Future. You can look it up. You can look it up on the internet. I go, will go to our website. Yeah. What is the website? How to design the future dot asu dot edu. Cool. But just type in all one word, how to design the future, and it'll pop up. Yeah. And uh, anyway, and uh, so we're now in the business of trying to scale the guide project up to allow zillions of people worldwide. What we've done is we've reverse engineered the patterns. We. We've got over 70 patterns right now that the guys who have su actually succeeded, what are the patterns that you find in common across the guys who have actually succeeded? Uh, not the way you wish this would work. Mm -hmm. Not the way you think this would work. What has worked? And we've got over 70 of those patterns, and we'll have perhaps 200 when this is all over. What's an example of a pattern? You break it, you buy it. Okay, like uh, ownership. Ownership. For, you're making your mistake, and that's my mistake. I fix it, or I, right. I remedy so, it to the person. So, who in this case, for example, the 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 most flagrant disaster in the history of trying to design the future is go fast and break things. Okay, right, Zuckerberg, Facebook. That without, is the without liability and without, personal. Without, for, for, yeah, are you for you or for the society or anything else? Yeah. That was probably the stupidest thing in the history of design of this nascent thing about designing the future. Yeah, yeah he'll pay he'll pay for this forever, and yeah, there's no guarantee the company will survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so that's a that's a big pattern. That's a big learning. All these other guys say you know, th did you, that get out of hand, hmm? or did that get out of hand like? He didn't have any adult. I mean, uh, you you can speculate about this. Yeah, forever. sure. He didn't yeah. have any adult supervision. Right. That's the thing about he was Google. Was a kid when he started it. Yeah, I mean, they were all kids, but but Google, the board of directors put in adult supervision. Yeah. They, you know, they they had a they had a guy there who was, you know, so they couldn't just do anything they wanted. So, you I mean, this will be deba debated for generations. Yeah. You know, because we are at this inflection point in history. But anyway. The point is, so we're coming back around to education, and uh, so what will what what will it look like? And um, I guess the major thing we came away with is that whether this involves tribes, small tribes in the desert, or lar or or global internet operations, or brain implants, or whatever, there's going to be one thing you can pretty much count on is there are always going to be three levels of, of stuff. One is going to be data, mm -hmm. and the next up from that is going to be knowledge, and the next up from that is going to be wisdom. And the point of education is to provide wisdom. It's fascinating. I will jump into the short answers. So as a prolific writer, if you were to write a book about your experience as a parent what might be the name of a couple chapters making this up as you go along yep that's the title <laughs> yeah and you end up learning as much as you impart yeah 
the, I mean, as I say, so I'm surrounded by women, right? Mm-hmm. And that has been, I can't tell you how endlessly educational that has been. <laughs> <laughs> I can't begin to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they never wanted to teach you anything, but they. <laughs> I had no choice. I had no choice. <laughs> That's fabulous. Um, so, you go down in history. What kind of dad would you like to be remembered as? With no convicted felons. Oh well, I I can I can guess I can sort of think about that and answer that question. So there was a time in my twenties. I had a pal, my boss. Larry Sturrant, and uh, he was a uh, famously, he was kind of a legend in his own time. And one afternoon, he was playing tennis. He said, ouch, I've been stung by a bee and dropped dead. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was a huge flap in Washington, and there was this investigation to find out if it was. Russian agents, which was a credible scenario. Really? Yeah, a bunch of things like that. Anyway, be that as it may. So, I and I was in Alaska at the time, working on the book, working on Nine Nations, and uh, flew back for the for the serve for the for the memorial, and picked up my pal Bill Curry in Denver, and we talked about this on our way back, and uh, got there and. Uh, it was at the Friends Meeting House on Florida Avenue in D.C. And I'll never forget this. It was not air-conditioned. And in the front row, there were three women in widow's weeds trying to outwidow each other. <laughs> one, <laughs> one was his wife, the other was his ex-wife, and the third was his girlfriend. No. Yeah. Well, I just thought that was the most wonderful thing I'd ever seen in my life. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was wonderful. And uh, so anyway, so I said to myself, you know, I want to spend the rest of my life being surrounded by women. Well, be careful what you <laughs> ask for. <laughs> <laughs> I did end up with that. And so anyway, just not the way I had envisioned originally in planned it anyway and uh anyway so the lesson from that is to uh yeah is to be careful what you ask for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well um uh, do you watch much television or movies do you have a favorite television or movie dad huh i read more than i watch i i i i miss the golden age of television largely i feel like i mean i have something to do in my dotage i can catch up on all these great shows yeah I wonder what Huckleberry Finn would have made as a dad. That's interesting. Yeah. I do wonder about that. You know, here was one of the great characters in American literature and one of the great outlaws and one of the great guys. And anyway, and I had a hunch he'd make a pretty good dad. Yeah. I think his kids would be okay. Cool. (laughs) Very cool. If you had the opportunity, money, time, space, no object, to give a gift... To every father on the planet, what gift might that be? Well, time. I'm not sure that time, well, I don't know this. I'm making this up. I I mean, you sprung this on me. I haven't really thought it through. Yeah. I'm not sure that time with the kids per se is the magic thing Mm -hmm. and at the same time that i don't believe that there's such a thing as quote unquote quality time yeah but i think there's somewhere in between i mean one of the things i've learned is that they do listen you just can never tell when (laughs) (laughs) might be something you said 10 years ago and they decide to listen and it's not necessarily the what you wanted them to listen to (laughs) you know and uh they're watching yeah they're they're watching and they are they're yeah. watching and they're listening and they're processing and and that's the part you can't control anyway so uh but uh so again you do the best you can with what you got at the time and uh and um if you're lucky yeah you know, i guess if i could bequeath it, it is the opportunity to realize when you screwed up and 
make it and, and, and hope to be able to adjust. What an incredible answer. That's an incredible answer, Joel. I like that a lot. Um, imagine you are on I-95 going 75 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour, however fast you go, and there's you have a billboard, and on that billboard has to be legible to people driving at that speed a piece of advice. Could be parenting advice, could, but but a piece of advice to dads, maybe something you know or something someone shared with you. What would you put on that billboard? I got a huge wall hanging in my office in here that's now faded with time. And I might put that up there. And it says, not all who wander are lost. J.R.R. Tolkien. There, there's layers <laughs> to that. There, t- I wandered, and I think yeah. my my parents, and I yeah. think, and I think the girls did too. Yeah. And I, I'd like. It sometimes it occurred to me. I wonder how long. I wonder if they've spent time. I especially Evangeline. I know she's paid attention to that one, mm-hmm. and uh, and she also. I also had a little button from the '60s that I had up there that I know she's paid attention to. It says, "Subvert the dominant paradigm." That takes a minute. That takes a minute, yeah. Especially if you're little. Yeah. No, <laughs> you have yeah. to look up all. <laughs> yeah, you have to figure out what paradigm you're a part yeah, but, of. But she's paid, but she's paid attention to all of those things. And, uh, but the, uh, I mean, the subvert, the 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 business about not all who wander are lost is that being weird is not an unmixed blessing. Believe me, I can speak from great experience but it um the uh but it's not necessarily but i mean but if you if you if you if you're weird and your father is weird and you know and and you look at your dad and you realize well he made it okay so maybe i'll make it you know maybe there's a hope for me too Mm -hmm. i didn't have that privilege my father was as straight and narrow and and normal and he's just as normal as they come anyway but uh evie had the opportunity to have a father who was at least as weird as she was and uh so therefore i guess i like to think she could possibly take some hope i think that's so cool it speaks to me it speaks to giving your kids permission to be authentically themselves which allows them to blossom in their most you know in, in the place that makes the most sense to them to a point yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Except for this and this and this and this. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got two more questions for you. First one was one that was lent to me that I really enjoy. When in your life do you feel the most love? Have I ever or felt mm, the most Just love? generally. Or however you care to interpret the question and answer it. I should take the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to upset anybody. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't have I don't have a glib answer to that. Yeah, that's fair. So, all right. And finally, in the event that this recording lasts beyond any apocalyptic scenarios you might conjure, the a message that might benefit Simone, Lewis, Lewis's children. Lewis's children, a message that Joel Grow could deliver to the generations that follow that you feel would, might be worth sharing? Well, you know, there was this, that story I told you about how we were in the business of creating happy humans. Yeah. And happy, there's, there's, there are levels to happiness if you, if you start drilling down into this. Okay. And, and one is the, uh, you know, the kind of loosey-goosey, happy, you know, Doris Day giggles. Shits and giggles kind yeah. of happiness. Then there was the second level, which is what Thomas Jefferson meant by pursuit of happiness. Mm-hmm. And he was channeling Aristotle and Udemy and all that stuff. And that that meant a, essentially, it meant a a life with me, a, a life with uh, of 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 uh, with scope, and a life with meaning, and finding your place in a place like that. Yeah. And and it gets more complicated after that. But anyway, but that whole, that whole second thing is happiness in the sense of of a meaningful life in a in a 
world affording its scope. That level of happiness, if you aim for that, you can, how, how, how wrong can you go? Love it. Thank you. It's awesome. Thank you, Joel. All right, man. Love talking to you, man. All right. Pleasure.